And now I would like to introduce our executive director, Peter Arnold. Thanks, Anya. Thanks, everybody who's uh, joining in uh, today's session, which is, I think, Anya, the 10th week of our summer scholar series of workforce preparedness sessions and master classes. Today's is especially um, meaningful to us. It's going to be a conversation on building a beauty brand with Sephora. So we're really pleased. Thank you, Sephora and Sephora colleagues for joining us today to learn more about Sephora's accelerated program, which focuses on supporting BIPOC beauty brand founders. And we're going to hear from some of those founders today who have benefited and are benefiting from the Accelerate program. Um, one of our panelists is Robin DeLay, who's the VP of Global Merchandising and Business Development and Strategy at Sephora. Welcome, Robin. And Robin is joined by three Accelerate um, program participants, uh, Megan Graham, who's the founder of Rees. Welcome, Megan. Uh, Priyanka Ganju, who's the founder of Kofi, and Kiku Chowdhury, who's the co-founder of Shaz and Kicks. Welcome, guys. So I am going to jump right in um, and probably, I think, Robin, start with you and ask you maybe just an introduction, um, you, what you do at Sephora, a little bit maybe about how you got to do what you are doing, and um, we'll go from there. Perfect. All right. Well, first, um, it's a pleasure to meet all of you virtually. I apologize. I can't see your faces, but um, it's just wonderful to be on this call. So thank you for taking the time to join us today. As Peter mentioned, uh, my name is Robin Dulay. I am the SVP of Global Merchandising and Business Development and Strategy at Sephora. Um, in my current role, I have um, really the honor of overseeing our Accelerate program which is our longstanding incubator program. And most importantly, through that role, I have the chance to get to know some of the wonderful founders that you will get to know on our call um, today. Our program focuses exclusively on helping BIPOC founders really establish and grow their business and ultimately launch their brands at Sephora. Um, I've been with Sephora about 10 years and I've sort of held various roles, but one of the things that I'm most focused on is cultivating and shaping our Sephora product assortment. Um, and, you know, we're really here today to talk about the Sephora Accelerate program. So I'm super excited to share with you um, about the program, but most importantly, Peter mentioned before we kicked off this call um, that you're, you're very eager to hear from our founders. So I hope that the majority of the time you'll have the opportunity from here to hear from Kiku, Priyanka, and Megan, who are just like incredible. And we're so proud to have them as part of our Accelerate program. Um, and they all graduated as well. So without further ado, that's kind of <laughs> uh, my introduction. Thanks, Robin. Maybe just give us a little bit of a sense of where you came from, what you studied, what job you might have held um, at Sephora or before Sephora that led to where you are now. Absolutely. So I often say beauty found me. I wasn't planning to get into beauty. I accidentally, um, for lack of a better word, ended up getting a job at Bare Essentials. I started off in sales. Some of you may remember that brand. It was kind of hot in like the 2000s. Um, and I was there for almost 10 years. And then I came on to Sephora as business development manager. And as I shared, um, I'm often given just, you know, projects that haven't existed before. Um, so have worked on things like Color IQ, Sephora, Accelerate, and many things that I will not remember uh, over our 10 years here. Um, but yeah, just to answer your question, I, I love beauty and my entire career um, has been in the beauty industry and yet not intentional from the beginning. So hopefully that helps. Yeah. <laughs> and, and one other question, just as the VP of Global Merchandising Business Development Strategy, and I know you you include in that scope oversight of Accelerate, but what does that what does that position mean? What does it entail, Robin? What does it entail? So we'll get into a little bit more detail, but um, the program is actually fairly longstanding. 
It started in 2016, um, and we'll get into that question, but in terms of what Accelerate is today, the biggest part of the scope was revamping the program to be exclusively focused on BIPOC, and more importantly, that the content curriculum and the program itself, the framework, meets the unique needs of um, our BIPOC founder community. Um, so it's really sort of the full management of the Accelerate program, but the biggest piece being um, the reintroduction and the reimagining of the program in 2021. Got it. And yeah, you, we are joined by three graduates. Um, can't wait to hear from them. Um, you uh, helped us understand that this program really spans the full range of Sephora's product categories. So it's makeup, skincare, hair care, fragrance. Um, just tell us a little bit more. I'd love to know, first of all, it seems like a little bit of a pivot to focusing on BIPOC talent. What was the rationale behind that? Absolutely. So twofold. One, um, we at Sephora, we definitely want to be leaders of change for the beauty industry at large. Um, that was a big part when we founded the program in 2016. As I mentioned, it was it was it was focused on female founders. At the time, we felt there was a big opportunity. Many of the brands were founded by males. Um, and then more recently, with kind of why we wanted to change the focus into BIPOC outside of um, primarily making sure that our product represents the beauty needs of our kind of diverse clients was to lead the industry. And it also dovetails into our commitment with the 15% pledge, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, so that's really why we wanted to kind of meaningfully invest and foster the growth of our BIPOC founded brands and ultimately ensure that they have long-term success um, at Sephora. And so a big part of the change of the program was making sure that we are setting up the brands to launch at Sephora, where previously they may go through the program. And in fact, most of them, you know, didn't launch at Sephora. Got so it. those were some pivots so within. As an Accelerate participant, and we'll, I know we'll hear from them shortly, but yes. what does the Accelerate program do for, for me if I was a participant? What, what am I getting from it? Absolutely. So it's a six month journey. Um, it features a fairly robust curriculum, everything from supply chain to meeting with brand founders that are um, intimately aware of Sephora that have built their brands at Sephora. It involves mentorship from our merchant community. And to your point, Peter, we have merchants that sit within makeup, skincare, fragrance, hair. Each founder is paired with a merchant within their world. So they're really um, starting off their journey, understanding what it would take uh, to build your business at Sephora alongside our merchant partner. Um, there's also an opportunity for potential funding, as well as connections to our pool of investors, um, third party investors, we know that's a huge opportunity. And then of course, we as I mentioned, they, after participation, after graduation, each brand is often in a unique stage, but our ultimate goal after the six months is to either launch you or continue the relationship so you are on a path um, to launch. Amazing. Okay, I'm gonna now um, dig into hearing from the founders and Priyanka, I'm gonna start with you and put you under the spotlight. Maybe a little bit about you, your journey as a founder of a brand that's in the Accelerate program. And, um, you know, maybe a little bit of the meaning behind the brand name, Kofi, and, and you know, you're, you're far from Delhi today. So I'd love to just understand how you got here and um, what led to the beginnings of, of your brand. Absolutely. It's such a pleasure to be here today. I'm Priyanka. I'm the founder of Kofi. Kofi is a fun, high performance makeup brand that's inspired by my South Asian heritage and culture. So um, interestingly, growing up, I actually never wore makeup. So it's kind of wild to me that I'm starting a makeup brand, but that's kind of how, uh, you know, the journey is, is for me growing up, 
I never felt beautiful. I didn't feel that I belonged in the world, world of makeup, that I could wear makeup. It, it, there was a lot of judgment in my community. I grew up in Delhi in India uh, around makeup. So people thought you wore makeup to make your skin look lighter or they, you wore makeup to attract men. And so there was a lot of judgment that came with wearing makeup. So I kind of stayed away from it. And then when I started work, um, you know, at 22, I actually uh, moved to Singapore because for my undergraduate studies and I joined my first uh, kind of job and my coworkers would kept, keep telling me that I look tired all the time because I have dark circles, which are genetic for a lot of South Asian people. So that was my first trip to a makeup counter, which also ended up being really uh, a traumatic experience because I was told that I need to fix these things about myself. So my relationship with makeup was always like very, um, had a lot of baggage. But then I uh, actually moved to the US again to study. I did my MBA and uh, joined uh, work in business. And I started like, I actually ended up working in the beauty industry, which uh, again was because of my love for uh, business and kind of how the beauty industry was really changing. And it wasn't really necessarily because like Ron said, like the beauty industry found me, but one of the most magical things happened. I was working at Estee Lauder, I was playing around with product, and I realized how fun beauty can be. Like, it doesn't have to have all this judgment associated with it. It can be a way for me to express myself with color. And that was my aha moment being like, you know, I need to change that relationship with makeup. My relationship is changing. I want to create a brand that has that same impact, especially for people of color who may not always have had the easiest makeup journeys. And that's where really Kofi stems from. That's where our mission is, is to use makeup for self-expression and joy. And so, and that's why I named my brand after ice cream is because I went back and thought about uh, what were the happiest moments in my life. And Kofi is a South Asian dessert I used to eat. Uh, growing up in Delhi, and I wanted to uh, make my brand about that. So that's that's why if you know if you see our site, we're very colorful, and um, you know just we want to we want makeup to be joyful. Well, I love that story, <laughs> Priyanka. So you so you're in Singapore, and what were you doing there? What was your your job after school? My first job after school, I actually studied computer science in school, but then, so again, like <laughs> you can see how much your career can evolve, like no choice is ultimate. I studied computer science, but then I actually, my first job wasn't consulting. Um, I worked at BCG, which is a consulting firm, and I did management consulting. And from then I went to get an MBA. Got it. So then you're at Estee Lauder and you're playing around with makeup and you and your relationship shifts from kind of what sounded a little almost adversarial in the beginning to something very different. When did you have a moment where you thought, you know, I could take this newfound love of the product and make it my own? You know, when was that inflection point when you said I could leave Estee Lauder and, and do this? Yeah, absolutely. So after Estee Lauder, I actually went to another beauty company, Ipsy. And, um, you know, now we're like three, four years into the beauty industry in my career journey. And I was still looking for the brand that showcase people who look like me. And I felt like at the global stage, like Ron mentioned, a lot of be the beauty industry, especially as you start looking at the senior leadership, it's still controlled by a very narrow demographic, mostly of men and not as many BIPOC as you would want in terms of like the audience. And so I felt both from, uh, you know, at, a, at like a management level, ownership level, founder level, all the way to what we're seeing on social media, 360 degrees, there was this lack of representation for BIPOC. And so um, I think it was like kind of an evolving journey as I spent more time in the beauty industry. There wasn't like a single point where I was like, this is it. Like it was more this realization that I'm waiting for someone else to make this change happen. And, you know, why not me? Why, you know, I should try to do this myself. Nice. Um, I'm going to pivot to you, Megan, and just ask you a little bit of the first question that I asked Priyanka about, you know, your journey as a founder of Rees and, and how it all came about, and maybe what you were doing up until then. Um, I know there's a focus um, with your brand on sustainability. So maybe to touch on that too, Megan, about why that is such an important part of your brand's ethos. 
Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm Megan Graham. I'm the founder of Read, um, and it's pronounced like please. Uh, whether you see the word, I know it's difficult to pronounce sometimes, uh, but we make the first refillable, reusable travel bottle made specifically for beauty. Um, and I really made the brand because I wanted a sustainable solution myself. Um, I was traveling all the time for work. I used to work at Vogue and Allure and a lot of the Condé Nast brands. And so I would have all of these like very coveted beauty products, like all in my vanity, all over my desk and my purse, like everywhere. And I had these very like curated routines, but the second I would pack that to travel, you know, the whole system fell apart, basically. It was kind of like putting the goops in a little plastic bottle and then shoving that in a plastic bag. And then, you know, there was always like aluminum foil and tape involved somewhere, which was like never, never a pretty, never a pretty picture. So um, any, and just, you know, to kind of continue that journey, every time I would land, you know, the product would leak everywhere. I'd throw out the bottle, there'd be product loss. It was always kind of just a wash. Um, and so really the, you know, to simplify, I think the journey, it was, uh, there has to be a better way to do this. I should make a better bottle, kind of like Bianca was saying, you know, no one's done this, I guess I should try. Um, and so again, that's, that's really simplifying, I think the journey of a brand founder and what goes into making a product, but that was really how it started. Um, and, you know, I think when it comes to that sustainability part, the the most enjoyable part for me so far, I think as a business owner, as a brand founder has really been that building phase, you know, the first like two years of building the brand of doing all of the research, I think, um, you know, the the most incredible conversations with the most innovative materials in the world. I mean, people making resins from fish scales or captured methane and turning that into plastics. Um, and sustainability, you know, it's it's a hot topic. We talk about greenwashing a lot. You know, all of that is really really important. And when you're building from the ground up, you know, and you want to be sustainable, that's part of everything that you're doing of who you're talking to, how you're building it, because it is hard when you're years into a brand and to, to kind of flip and try to redo everything in a sustainable way. So starting a brand, you know, in 2019, 2020, that was really at the forefront. Um, and so I, I think it got to a point though, with where materials are now, it's kind of like, um, you know, do you, do you wait 10 years and, you know, make the thing out of the fish scales once they've done all their testing and once they've gotten to mass production and once their price points have gone down and all of those different things you have to think about as a founder, or do you do the most good with what's available? And so we kind of went that route of, you know, still planning for the future and still being, you know, on the forefront of these different materials, but what can we do now that does the most good? So we, you know, made the first fully reusable airless pump, which I'm super proud of, patented design. Patent, utility patented and everything. Um, and we use PCR, you know, it's FDA approved, it's safe for skin and hair. So we know it's good for consumers and all of the different beauty products that you're using. So um, yeah, I think that there's a lot of different things uh, of my unique journey that have come into making our bottles. Nice. Um, starting at Cunning Nest, was there, was it always your intention of like, okay, this is great right now, but I imagine myself as a founder or did, was this a surprise to you in terms of your journey and, and kind of the direction it took? No, I think it's so funny that like, I feel like none of us saw ourselves in beauty. I mean, <laughs> I don't know about Kiku, but like hearing from Robin and Priyanka, like I never saw myself in beauty. I was not a beauty girl. Um, my first job out of college was fashion forecasting. So I was going to all the trade shows and I was, you know, really behind the scenes. Um, and from there, I started working in ad agencies and ended up getting recruited by Vogue to lead their beauty marketing team. Um, and I dabbled like a little bit in some beauty brands like Clean and Clear, Neutrogena, um, but that was really my first, uh, my first introduction to beauty. And uh, yeah, I, I think like, you know, like Priyanka said, I saw such a, a gap uh, where, you know, there needed to be the sustainable solution. And, uh, you know, I really wanted to make a big difference in the industry. There's the, the beauty industry is responsible for, I think it's a third of plastic waste in landfills. It's billions of bottles every year. Um, so we're trying to make, you know, a small dent in a big problem um, and hopefully be a larger solution for that. Interesting. Thanks, Megan. I'm going to ask you, Kiku, to kind of uh, start the story similarly, if you can give us a sense of 
of how it started for you um, as a co-founder of a brand, um, but maybe the journey leading up to that will be great. And just to let the audience know, and I'm sure you'll do a better job of it than me, I mean, your brand is a hair care brand um, with a specific focus on, on specific sourced ingredients. So maybe a little bit of, of, of sharing about that too. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, Kiku Chowdhury, co-founder of Shaz and Kicks. We are a hair care and hair wellness brand. Um, and we harness the natural ingredients that are indigenous to the Indian subcontinent to holistically take care of your entire hair ecosystem. Um, Shaz and Kicks is actually um, the fun nicknames of myself and my co-founder, who's also my sister. These are our nicknames that our loved ones, our friends and family have called us since we were little kids. Um, so the brand is something that's incredibly personal and um, an extension of who we are as sisters, as women, as South Asian women. Um, and really um, kind of the beginning of this was really celebrating our Indian heritage. We're similar to similar to Priyanka. We we have we we come from the same region of of, of the world. Um, we're first gen Indian Americans. My sister and I we spent all of our summers uh, back in India in the lush green foothills of the Himalayas, which is where our family's from. And this is where we learned um, the wonderful healing rituals and practices of, um, of Ayurvedic science from our grandmother, from the wonderful woman in our family. These are rituals that have been really passed down um, for centuries uh, by women um, and they've really stayed within our culture. Um, and so we, we had this wonderful experience growing up and we really learned the art of taking care of your hair. Hair care is um, a really big part of Indian beauty um, for women. It is something that's like, you know, uh, talked about in ancient texts and, uh, you know, epic poems is uh, a big part of, a, of, of beauty and taking care of yourself is really taking care of your hair uh, from the time that you were like little babies. Um, as we got older, my sister and I, we didn't go back to India as much and we didn't have access to these ingredients and to these products that were primarily handcrafted, handmade uh, within, within these family uh, settings. Um, and, you know, and, and, and very similar to everyone else's uh, stories here is that we, neither my sister nor I come from beauty. It was not something, beauty and entrepreneurship was not something remotely on what we studied or what was on our roadmap or what we even thought we were capable of doing. Um, it was many years into our uh, more or less kind of corporate lives that we really started, uh, a few things lined up and then we started talking about um, and conceptualizing Shaz and Kicks. My background um, in undergrad, I studied as a cultural studies major. Um, I studied South Asian uh, art and uh, culture and women's studies. So there is like a common thread from like, you know, little 18 year old Kiku to now, you know, brand founder Kiku, even though my career has zigzagged around a lot. Um, I think there's the two common things is that uh, my love for stories and especially love of um, stories of, of other women, whether it be, you know, kind of historical or current day and how that changes and shifts uh, through culture and how that really impacts us. So that's what I started off studying. I had no idea what I was going to do with that degree, to be honest. I just really wanted to study it. My my parents were wonderful and they supported that. Um, but afterwards, I really entered the world of marketing, which is an extension of that. It's really understanding people and how they move and how they consume um, and really engage with, um, with culture and society, um, with products. So I went off and I, um, I entered digital um, ad agency world where I worked a lot on pharma and tech platforms and, and companies. Um, I went back to school and got my master's in marketing and specialized in data science and statistics, not because I was particularly interested in that, <laughs> but because um, I really wanted to, you know, I'm I'm Indian. I feel like, you know, we, we have a love of numbers and, um, you know, and I always felt like if I really had a good um, understanding and um uh, control over data and numbers that can really help me um, create just a strong foundation for, for my career. So that's what I specialized in. Um, I moved back to New York City and I also worked for Condé Nast and I uh, entered at Vogue and then GQ and I led digital strategy for them. So my, my career re really went off into the digital world and understanding um, the kind of ever-growing, evolving digital landscape. Um, and again, went back to storytelling, working for one of the world's biggest media companies. Um, I think the, the other common thing that was a thread in my in my career was that um, I really 
I really got a lot of joy out of working, um, but it always had to be meaningful. And it wasn't really what was the most practical or maybe what was the most reasonable or it wasn't uh, very risk adverse at all. Um, but I really wanted to um, derive value and meaning and happiness from my job, from my career. Um, and so I always kind of, that was what was, what always led me to take the next step. Um, so I came a few years ago, I came to another junction when it came to my career. Um, both my sister and I, we lived on separate continents for many years. We've always been super close. I lived in New York City, she lived out in Dubai. And then we moved back to Texas, which is kind of where we, where we grew up. Um, so that was like star number one aligning. Star number two was that we've, we've always wanted to do something together. Um, so like, it was like, the the love of sisterhood and us wanting to just spend more time together so that was that was like a driving factor and then the second one was our love for our our culture we wanted to really celebrate it and uh, share it with integrity um, and make it something that was um, something kind of global and um, that we would like really. Um, bring joy to our community, but also make it something that was accessible and fun and sexy to people outside of our communities. Um, and so that was kind of the second driving force. And the third one was going back to all of our childhoods, um, our, our childhood memories and like the wonderful practices that we learned uh, about taking care of our hair and using these wonderful nourishing Indian ingredients. We wanted to bring relevancy to them. We wanted to celebrate Indian culture, but really uh, create hair care that would be loved by all. And so those those were kind of the three driving factors that created Jazz and Cakes and we launched in 2020. Great. Um, you know, you talked about threads. Kiku, I, I feel like for each of the three of you, you know, there's a thread about where you started and what you were learning while you were doing the thing. Maybe that wasn't what you were going to do forever, but certainly, you know, Priyanka's MBA or Megan's experience, you know, at certain Vogue books that at doing beauty marketing, you know, um, and, and you too, Kiku, of course. Um, at some point, you guys realized that you were onto something and you had a viable, although nascent business. When did you say, okay, this is real and it's actually going to be my thing and I'm going to give up my day job? Like, what were the moments, you know, you talk, Kiku, about making sure you felt happy and fulfilled and what you were doing was meaningful. What were the other indicia that came to you and you're like, okay, this is, I, I'm headed in this direction and I, and this thing is starting to get traction and be, be real. Any of yeah, you know, it's, yeah. oh, sorry, should I? No, but any of this, go ahead. Coming in. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Didn't know if that was, if that was, if I should go first. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in since I already started talking. Um, I think uh, it's, it's hard. I feel like, you know, whenever this question is asked for me, there wasn't like this, like groundbreaking pivotal moment um, in that, that pre-launch, you know, or kind of pre, um, pre-real phase. It was something that um, if I thought too much about it, it would be just too scary and too overwhelming. <laughs> so it was just like day by day, I'm going to just be so um, heads down and um, and like kind of immerse myself in this decision that I'm making and um, just take it day by day, step by step. I, again, like I mentioned, neither my sister nor I have come from an entrepreneurial family. We didn't think we were going to start a business, let alone a beauty business that neither of us had any sort of experience in. So I think thinking too much about the things that you don't know <laughs> are was something that I like consciously uh, didn't do. And so it was just like, it was, it was, it was a mix of practicality and like just being quite naive and like just kind of immersing myself in the naivete. <laughs> um, we both kept our, we both kept our day jobs until, you know, uh, until like, uh, you know, until after we launched. Um, and so it was just like, I'm gonna like practically do my day job from, you know, and this is like the designated time I'm going to do it. And over the course of the, over the course of the two, the two years that were in pre-launch for us, where um, I was still working full time and working on this, it was like just a means to an end. It was like, whatever I was making on that, it was really like fun, the business. Um, and then it was just like, you know, tons of to-do steps and, and lists. And it was just like checking them off one by one and not, not thinking, uh, not thinking too much, honestly. I think that was, that was like, that was a little bit of, of my personal journey because there was just so many unknowns. Um, and I think when, when it became really real for us, we were supposed to launch right like in like March, April of 2020. Um, obviously like, you know, things that was not 
so many things changed during that time. I had just quit my job right before, um, you know, kind of the, the pandemic started. So I'd quit my job. I'm ready to launch. And, you know, the whole world blew up for, for many various reasons. Um, that were, you know, that were, that were very hard. Obviously one of them was, was us launching this, launching this company. And I think those, those, those months that led up to like completely things shutting down and not even knowing I like didn't have a job. I like didn't even know if I had a company anymore. Um, and really just, um, you know, freaking out for like a better, better phrase. Um, it was, um, at that point it was just like, there was like, I don't know, there was just like no going back. Like I like, I'd like let go of my full-time job and this just had to work. And so it was just like practicing the art of like patience and belief. And I don't know, like just good vibes <laughs> um, until, um, until yeah, until things did start kind of opening and, and unfolding into the new launch in August, 2020. But um, yeah, that was, I'll, I'll pause there. That was kind of like my my experience leading up to nice. the program launch. Nice. I mean, I know you, you didn't want to think about too much of it, but it sounds like two years of pre-launch thinking and working really led to kind of your ability yeah. to launch and, and succeed. Um, Priyanka, what yeah. about you in terms of, of of kind of when you knew that this was going to be viable and real? Yeah, so um, April 2019, I, I was in my job now in the beauty industry for about five years. I'd been thinking about the lack of representation and the lack of products for um, deeper skin tones, my skin tone for about three years at that point. And I typically have like a new idea every day. Like if I'm thinking about something for three years, that means that like it's real. Like, and I had some savings. So I was like, and I, I'm not good at multitasking. So I considered like, keeping my job and working on the company, but I'm, I knew that I couldn't do it. Like when I'm in, I'm like, I just need to be like 120% in, like I can't think about anything else. So I was at that point where I was like, um, you know, my corporate career was going well, but I felt like I wanted to kind of really make that change that I was wishing to see. And so um, just took the leap and quit my job and, uh, the first Monday then was really awkward because I was like, okay, what am I going to actually do? Uh, but one of the things I ended up doing was actually talk to who I considered my, you know, would be my customers. So I started just like um, setting up chats to people I'd meet on social media, like on Instagram or Facebook, I'd DM people and be like, hey, I'm building this beauty brand. Like, uh, do you want to chat with me? And many people actually said yes. So in New York coffee shops, I was just like meeting people and asking them about, you know, their beauty preferences, what's missing for them. And that was really, really eye opening and started to help me form what our, uh, what the brand would look like. And we start, we launched like our Instagram and, you know, it had like a few hundred followers, you know, we're now like almost like at the end of 2019, early 2020. But there were people who had like who were like really interested in kind of this idea of reimagining what an inclusive makeup brand would look like. And then, of course, the world shuts down. And that was definitely a point where I was like, I could and I had been advised by some very senior people that maybe you should just go and get a job again. Like, this is not a great time to build a brand like the world is shutting down. And I definitely had that moment where I was like, should I just go and get a st stable job? Like my savings are running out. <laughs> like, should I continue even on this journey? Um, but it was those people that I had met or who were in my, you know, Instagram, who were on our Instagram, who kept me going because they would send me messages like, we really need this to happen. Like, what are you doing next? Like, how's it go going? They would really send me supportive messages. And I felt that that was one of those points where I was like, I have something here that is going to be successful because there are people who are literally strangers on the internet who are telling me that they need this brand to happen. So um, that was, I think, the, the kind of next kind of milestone. And then eventually, finally, we launched in February 2021. Uh, you know, again, we had a very tight knit and small community that we had formed through a blog that we had on our we have on our site. Um, and, you know, from there, it's just like it just blew up. Like it was amazing just seeing the overwhelmingly positive response we we received. And um, then, of course, Sephora, uh, this was the time I was in Sephora Accelerate. So also Sephora picked us, we, I applied in October 2020, and they picked us before we had even launched. So again, that was another signal for me or sign, um, you know, as Kiko was mentioning to say like, hey, like, 
clearly if Sephora sees the potential in this before we've even launched, again, like I'm on to something that is going to be meaningful. So I think it's uh, similar to what Kiku says, like sometimes you just have to believe because you're re really creating something that doesn't exist and you just have to believe that it's going to happen and you look for these signs um, and you ignore the signs that, you know, maybe tell you otherwise, like, or are trying to be like the rational, logical signs. You're like, I'm not looking at you. I'm only looking at like the signs that are encouraging and you keep, keep building. Yeah. But I do love hearing that that personal sense of this being right, as opposed to somebody else's objective measure was, was your driver and yours, Kiku. Megan, what about for you? I know you talked a little bit about realizing that this was a white space and it was quite clear that no one had figured this out like when did it become more real for you and feel viable and feel like this is a business and a brand that i can launch yeah um well i think just on priyanka's note there's like you have to kind of believe in it so much that like you feel like you're going insane almost like that's definitely a sign of entrepreneurship is just you're like now i'm gonna keep going with this like there are a lot of signs maybe saying no but like we're gonna keep going because you love it so much i think that's like the thing is is if you've had this idea and everything for a long time um it just kind of like becomes part of your soul and that was definitely how, what it was for me was you know i didn't start building until 2019 but i'd had the idea uh, since like 2010, you know, for, for a decade, really, before I started building it. And so when I looked at, you know, Vogue and everywhere, you know, at Condé Nast and looking at these senior roles and just thinking like, I don't really see myself here. Like, what am I, you know, early thirties, like, what am I, what am I doing? What am I working towards? And so the first thing that popped in my head was like the bottle, like building the better bottle was the thing I have constantly been thinking about it's just time to do it. And it's, you know, kind of this combination of their stories of like, you know, continuing to work full time, you know, I was still working every day, but I was like, I'm going to take literally $10,000 and I'm going to pour everything I have and every dollar of this into trying to build it. And if, you know, at the end of the day, I build a nice little travel set for myself, like fantastic. And like, that's, you know, you know, of course it's very like naive thought, but that, that was kind of the mindset going into it was like, here's what I have. And like, I'm going to do everything to get there. And, you know, 2020. Um, so instead of using, you know, those hours that I would commute, right, I would pour those into like research time and talking to different people, you know, those 2020 was was truly, um, it was like a blessing for me in a lot of ways, you know, not doing all of those getting ready and commuting and doing all of those things and social hours, it freed up so much time for me just to be in the house and to work and to build it was, uh, it was really, it's, it's such a weird way to say that, but it was um, a really grateful for kind of that shift in society in a way. Um, so that's what I did with my, you know, quarantine time was I just built and built and built. And, you know, I would survey people and I would do all of those things to build the brand. And I also applied, you know, in October, uh, 2020 to the Accelerate. And I applied with, um, you know, a pitch deck and a logo and, and a dream. And, um, and it was very, it was really validating for, you know, to be, uh, you know, in a cohort of you know beautiful color cosmetics and innovative skincare and all of these beautiful brands and you know we're an empty bottle but Sephora really saw that's the future of sustainability you know we need to be on board with this and they immediately got it and I built the brand for the Sephora consumer um, and so for them to for Sephora to, to immediately see what we were doing and take us on that was that was definitely the moment for me um, but it still took me another year till I quit my full-time job so <laughs> Awesome. Uh, that's so fascinating. Um, I'm going to shift, Robin, to you. You know, having heard, and, and it's no surprise to me that Priyanka, Megan, and Kiku were Accelerate participants. Um, what do you look for? What does Sephora look for in an applicant? Like, what is it about an, an applicant or a brand? And it seems like these were almost all pre-launched. Like, how do you know what, what what's the, the the important aspect that you guys look to to make your selection of who is going to be a grantee? Absolutely. So, you know, at Sephora, we like to say that brand building is in our DNA. Um, and a big part of that is the power of the founder and their vision. And so to your point, there was no question when we saw the video submissions um, that we, you know, each, as you've heard from Priyanka, Kiku and Megan, each brand has a very, very unique story. Um, but ultimately, they have, um, you know, really strong vision. 
So one of the things we look for is vision and passion. We've worked with founders for a really long time um, and it is often the founder, their passion, the strength of that vision that is going to create the longevity needed to go through a lot of the ups and downs. So um, the first thing is vision. Um, and we also look for innovation. So we talk at Sephora a lot about product differentiation. We talk about meeting unmet beauty needs. And as you heard from uh, Kiku, Priyanka and Megan, I mean, they're really at the forefront of thinking about what is a beauty need of a client um, that just isn't met today whether it be something like hyperpigmentation, uh, which Priyanka spoke to, although their portfolio um, doesn't meet that need, to um, a sustainable, refillable um, travel hair uh, container in Megan's case. We're really looking for products that our clients can't find elsewhere, but will help um, elevate their, their beauty experience. And then from a product perspective, it's interesting. Part of what we say with brand building is in our DNA, we're very comfortable getting in the kitchen with brands. So um, we do see if a brand has a working prototype and if they've iterated on it, and sometimes they do, and they're further along, like in the case of Shaz and Kicks, it's kind of baked. <laughs> um, and then we have others that we are working alongside the brand founder taking that vision, taking that differentiated product idea and co-developing what the product will look like. But, um, you know, just to answer your question, there's, there's three elements. There's the vision, which comes through strong on the video, um, that differentiated product, and then, um, you know, product being king on our world, just, um, you know, understanding the white space as well. Got it. Yeah, all those three elements are coming through my Zoom screen as well, guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things that each of our scholars uh, benefits from in our program is that they get a mentor from the industry, someone a little more senior who can help them along. It did sound like for the three of you, you were on your own doing this pretty solitary. Kiku, you ultimately partnered with your sister, but were there folks, were there mentors? I mean, clearly Sephora in a big sense was a mentor, but but were there mentors that helped you that you learned from? Did you seek one out? Um, what was that journey like for any of the three of you? Yeah, um, so Nancy Twine was one of the mentors for our cohort. And, um, you know, I think personally, she's been an incredible mentor. She's the founder of Briogeo uh, Clean Hair Care. Uh, she was an early investor in Rees. And I think for me, it was really important. Um, you know, she's built an incredible business and she's, you know, an incredible Black woman. And so having that perspective and someone who really knew how to build financially, um, that was really important. You know, I'm a creative marketer, you know, so building that business part of the, uh, you know, of Rees and of my brand was really important. Um, and she's she's just a powerhouse. So it was um, you know, just kismet that meeting of having her in the Accelerate and having her to really help guide Rees um, then and now. And how did you navigate that mentoring relationship, Megan? Did you guys structure it or was it a little bit more organic in terms of when you heard from her, how you learned from her? It's a great question. Um, I think, you know, we, we kind of did both. At first it was a little unstructured and then we would kind of set meetings as we got a little further along. Um, and, you know, as that kind of, formal mentorship ended. Um, now it's kind of, you know, again, checking in every now and then. And, uh, you know, I think especially as an investor that has a structure on its on its own of, you know, sending quarterly reports and, and you know, giving updates like that. But I think from a one-on-one -on -one perspective, um, you know, it kind of had to find its footing for, for the first few months. Got it. And Kiku and Priyanka, what about you in terms of someone in the industry or just someone more senior, someone who served that role for you and anybody like that? So I have a different story in the sense that I had been in the beauty industry for a bit. So I had a few people that I counted on as mentors in the industry, but they all told me not to do coffee. So I kind of fired them as mentors. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes that happens, right? Like they've always seen you as a certain type of person, right? They've, they've seen your career go in a different way. And then you say, I'm going to be an entrepreneur and I'm going to build something that 
they don't see the white space that you see and they don't believe in it. But then I started applying for a lot of competitions. And I think like applying for like fun scholarship funds like this, like applying for Accelerate. I applied for, there was a entrepreneurship dream project. There's a few other Accelerators, Gold Rush, which is a gold house, uh, Asian focused incubator. So if there was a competition accelerator out there, I applied for it. And actually that was really beneficial because the ones that we got selected to, and uh, I, you know, I started getting paired with mentors through those programs. And sometimes I would just also cold outreach. So some of our earliest uh, investors are in the beauty industry, um, are like um, a couple of them, like Hero Cosmetics, which is Juru. She's a founder. I LinkedIn messaged her and she responded and we got on a call and she invested. So sometimes you just, and not everyone's going to respond, but sometimes you have to fire your old mentors who may not necessarily see the direction <laughs> you're going in and find new ones who believe in you. I'm not sure I'm encouraging our scholars to fire their mentors, but, <laughs> but your point is well made. <laughs> yes, part of it is always take everyone's advice with a grain of salt. You exactly. know, it may not work for you. Fair enough. What about you, Kiku, in terms of just uh, other folks out there that might have been helpful in a mentoring capacity? Yeah, so... Um... Uh, echoing a lot with, with Priyanka, we've also been part of other other kind of mentorship accelerate programs. Um, it's great. It, 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 you know, we, we've found some really wonderful mentors through that way. Um, our one of our I think our our biggest mentors, advisors and an investor. Her name is Divya Gugnani. She is a veteran in the beauty industry. She's um, had multiple beauty companies recently. She's a CEO and founder of Wander Beauty. Um, and she's just been like I've, she's just been iconic in the beauty industry as you know, kind of uh, I've been a fan and a follower of hers for many years. Um, and and it's kind of like um, I, you know, when, when you're starting off something new and you feel like you're so itty bitty and a bit of a nobody, you're like, you don't, you can't fathom, uh, you can't fathom sometimes getting a hold of, of anyone of that, you know, that kind of level of someone that is super seasoned within an industry um, that is very high level. Um, but I came across Livia like, through Instagram DM, um, I started following, you know, I followed her from, I've, I've followed her through as a personal person for many years and then as a business and I just cold DM'd her um, and just reached out to her. And it was one of those things where I'm like, okay, she's never going to reach out to me. Um, and she did. And she's like, oh, I've seen your brand around. I'd love to try out. I send her over products and, um, she loved them. She believed that believed in them. We met in person, like very soon after that. And she came on as, and on board as an investor and an advisor. Um, and, um, yeah, as, and as someone is like our, our main go-to on a, on a daily basis. So I feel like a bit of my story is, people that you think that are so way out of your, out of your reach or out of like your kind of realm, um, they're not. And that, that's been the story for, uh, with a few instances for us. And that's just kind of our favorite example, but, um, you know, reach for the stars. If there's someone that you really admire, uh, that you really think could, you know, could be a wonderful mentor, um, nobody, you know, I feel like in this day and age, DM, LinkedIn, whatever, you know, everyone is reachable and you will be surprised at who responds back. And my other quick little add on is I want to say, um, pre Priyanka and I uh, met in our pre-launch days through, again, through Instagram. She was talking about building out Kofi in 2019. Um, we just came across each other's paths and we connected. We became friends. And, um, you know, I would say she's like a friend mentor. You know, we, we, we don't like our, our brands are relatively around the same age. So, um, but she, again, she has wonderful industry knowledge. And I think finding a um, mentorship in in others who are perhaps in the same uh point in their journey with you can be incredibly helpful you know Priyanka and I sometimes we both don't know something <laughs> and we just talk it out with each other or you know again one of us may be like a little bit farther ahead and something else and so I think finding mentorship and um uh and help within kind of your peers who are at the same point in their journey can be super helpful as well Thanks for that. That's really inspiring. We've heard from a number of our now alums, former scholars, that having a mentor that's not so senior, someone that you can talk to a little more candidly, is as helpful, mm -hmm. if not more so, than someone who's very, very senior that you want to learn from. But Priyanka, yeah. if you have a friend mentor, you can't fire them. So you can't fire Kiku. Yeah, so you Caution can't fire you. me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, nobody's getting fired here. Kiku <laughs> and Megan are both on my text. Like we've been, in fact, uh, Megan, I don't know if I'm allowed to share, but we're both launching in Sephora very soon. And so we both have been, uh, you know, texting each other, like what's going on. And so it's, it's, 
it's like Kiku said, it's amazing to have that group. And, uh, you know, she, Kiku's been my support system, Megan's been my support system. And um, it's actually really great to have a program like Accelerate, which further solidified and kind of connected us as a cohort. That's so nice to hear. Um, you know, Robin, you kind of framed the conversation when you talked about beauty finding you, and it almost seems like that was a story that was the story of, of, of the three of you as well that were in the Accelerate program. We're talking to students today, and many more are going to be watching this recording. Was there anything now that you, sh if, if you had been able to study or some direction or job, was there something that you wish you had learned along the way to better serve you where you are now? Anybody? We had Joseph Baltazar last week. He said, I really should have learned about how to make a pattern. So like... <laughs> I think for me, it's not a specific course, but I would say like a mindset or a framework towards just doing things and not asking for permission. I think that's the biggest thing that I've learned as an entrepreneur is like, sometimes you don't know anything and, you know, maybe there's a course like marketing or graphic design or something that you haven't, you feel intimidated and you feel like I can't do this, just do it. Just kind of take that leap of faith and, uh, you know, you'll, you'll figure it out. So I think just kind of having that framework of not waiting for someone to, give you validation or permission, just go and like do it. If you are interested, just try it out. Like there's no downside. Nice. Okay. Anybody else about a course of study or just a, a topic that might've served you better had you pursued that? Or not? <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's, I mean, I feel like there's, um, there's like two very tactical things that are just really important in starting a business is one is kind of the legal aspect of it. And the other one's kind of the, the counting and the finance aspect of it. I don't, you don't need to be a lawyer or a finance person to start a business, but um, you know, to, if there's anything like, you know, again, just even just things that you can get familiar with, uh, get comfortable with and or um, hire the right person for if that's not your, if that's not your space. But um, I think that, um, you know, those are kind of the, the two, uh, again, tactical things that are just really important in running a business that, um, you know, you can, again, you don't need to be a lawyer or an accountant to be a brand owner, but, um, but it, it, those are kind of helpful skills. Yeah, and I, I think I think you're constantly learning um, as an entrepreneur. I think that's the biggest part of it is constantly being a student um, and not going into certain situations feeling like um, you should know or being upset that you don't know. I think it's just learning and finding the right people, you know, to teach you. I think we all, you know, majored in very different things. My, I was a textile sciences major, so you know, there there are parts of that 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 I take into what I do, and so I, I don't think it's so much about the courses that you're taking. Um, because there's always going to be a situation like I wish I took every course I guess maybe is my answer because <laughs> some part of every type of job comes up um you know in the day to day so nice thanks Megan yeah um that that question was from one of the questions that popped up another one we really unfortunately and it's for all good reason just probably have time for one more um note that the audience a number of members are going to want to start their own businesses are thinking about that and specifically beauty businesses. Any advice, guys, that you would give to your younger self or you give to an audience member who is thinking about doing what, in fact, you guys have done um, as kind of your parting words? And that includes you, Robin. So I'll have the founders go first and then I. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's not. Part of me wants to say like, start now, you know, like I, I wish I had done it sooner, but I'm also really proud of all the things that I learned in all of my different jobs that got me to where I am. So I think it's, you know, start when you feel the time is right and work on it a little. You don't have to do everything at once. I think we all built for many, many years before we got to this point, before we launched in Sephora, all of that. So it doesn't happen overnight. Um, and yeah, I, I think it's just constantly kind of be thinking about it and, and learning and um, absorbing everything you can because it will all uh, make a difference when you do start down that path. So I know it's kind of general, but, um, but yeah, it all plays a part. Yeah. 
Thanks, Megan. That, that's wonderful. I think, you know, when you said that you had started thinking about this in 2010 and you are now launching it, I mean, it's, it's quite incredible. But I think, you know, in 12 years, all of what you gained along the way in terms of knowledge and experience has gotten you. So thank you very much for that. What about you, Priyanka, or you, Kiku, just in terms of uh, parting advice to your younger self? I would say build your audience. Like, um, you know, with social media, especially, I think it's easier than ever to connect with the people that you want to build for. And that's going to change and evolve too. But I think about all of the experiences that I went through, like, how do you get my, get, the first beauty job, how do you, all of these things I could have continued to share uh, through social. And I know that that wasn't, I am very like proud of, you know, kind of how I ended up building the brand, but there were, there's all these moments that you can share with your community and start building a followership, um, knowing that you're going to build a brand and knowing that there's this audience that you can learn from because they'll tell you what they need and um, having that relationship early is, is great. So if you're thinking of starting a beauty brand, just start building that community around you, whether it's on social or an email list, a publication, anything, any way kind of to get your message across and get people to um, find people who, who love what you're doing. Thanks for that, Priyanka. What about you, Kiku? Yeah. Um... I would say that I think it's finding the right balance of like risk taking, but also um, making sure that there is a lot of validity in, in launching a brand. I mean, I, there is a lot of sexiness around being an entrepreneur about, you know, starting your own company. And there, there's a lot of wonderful things about that, but it's also um, incredibly hard. And, um, and of course, yes, you need to work hard. You need to really believe in yourself. But I think it's really important to also make sure that what you are creating, there is space for. And it's very crowded and almost in every industry, but there is space for everything. But I think it's really important to um, make sure that what you're creating is uniquely yours, that there is an audience. And I feel this kind of links back to, you know, kind of all the things that Megan mm -hmm. and Priyanka said, um, and that there is validity to it, you know, whether that through be through kind of like maybe some sort of innovation that you're creating something newness that doesn't exist, you know, a mix of um, of what Priyanka saying of that, you know, you've built a community. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's just really making sure that there that you have some sort of like um, understanding that there is space for this you know, brand that you're creating um, in all different ways. Yeah, no, that makes a great deal of sense. Um, Robin, so uh, we've heard some compelling stories of, of Accelerate um, participants and brand founders. Uh, maybe just your advice to future Accelerate, um, either applicants or, or recipients of, of the program. Absolutely. So I will say in full transparency, when many of us at Sephora are asked, would you start a new brand? We very humbly say no. And we say, <laughs> because we know too much. Um, and, and we say that in the most humble way, because we know that the patience and the courage required to start your own brand is really in many ways, um, you know, the, the largest under a huge undertaking um, that everyone is taking on. So I would just, you know, say, be kind to yourself, be kind to those around you. Um, Patience is a virtue. It takes a really, really long time. It can be a long journey as we've heard um, here today. And, and the only other thing I might add is conviction. Um, as you're being kind, as you're having that courage is to maintain your conviction because um, we're super humble at Sephora with every founder we work with. Um, each journey is incredibly unique. Um, and it takes a lot of commitment. So we're just so appreciative of our founders and when they share, you know, their babies with us. Um, they're interesting. We often say their care with us um, and we don't take that lightly. So yeah, just be kind to yourself um, What is what I would say. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Amazing, guys. And I, you know, I did mention passion, but Robin, you're absolutely right. What the three of you started and are completing and, and engaged in requires courage uh, of, of conviction of your own ability to do it. So I really applaud the three of you for everything you've accomplished heretofore and what I know is about to come. So um, 
thank you for sharing it all with us today. I'm really, really grateful to you. And thanks to Fora and to you, Robin, for facilitating uh, today's session. We're really, really appreciative. Terrific, guys. Thank thanks you so much. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.